Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the First World War. I'm Mike B, and today we're going to be talking about one of those uncomfortably uh, negative topics that I mentioned in um, one of my uh, Basic Bitch History videos. And that is going to be the treatment of German Americans in dur during the First World War, and more so during the time when the U.S. got involved in the First World War. So, you know, to start this off, basically German Americans have been here almost as long as any other ethnic group and um, countries, people. They've been here since colonial times. Uh, the biggest influx of German-American immigrants came in the 19th century and up until about 1910. That was the biggest time where uh, Germans were fleeing Germany or their nation state at that point and actually trying to become Americans, get over here. And with that, they still kept their traditions um, like uh, their customs, they spoke German, and they were trying to assimilate and learn English the best as they could, but there was areas, um, like specifically up in the upper Midwest, where a lot of them settled. You got basically some on the East Coast, in the upper Midwest, and then oddly enough in Texas. Those are the three biggest places for German-American immigrants in the United States. So in areas where it was more concentrated like that, like, um, so if you don't know, I'm from Wisconsin, and I live very close to Minnesota, and South Central Minnesota and this whole area, Wisconsin, Minnesota in general, has a ton of German immigrants that came here, um, German families, and from the beginning of time, they settled up here. So it's a very, there's a lot of German crossover in our culture that things we don't even think about. But anyway, getting off topic, that's going to be relevant, or not, not off topic, but it's going to be relevant in a little bit. So basically, they were like any other group, the, the French Canadians, the, the Polish, you know, Italians, they, they took crap from people, but they were mostly left alone. They were kind of just doing their own thing. Uh, with that, you had Mennonites, uh, the Amish that were kind of in their own thing. They didn't want to have anything to do with really war or anything. They just wanted to practice their religious practices and their cultural practices and be left the hell alone, which is totally understandable. And so... There were tensions with Germany because of some scuffles they had with the Philippines, a disagreement. But overall, it wasn't really that terrible until 1914 when the propaganda began. Uh, you know, the if you don't know about that, the whole German soldiers bayoneting Belgian babies and stuff, which we'll cover in another video, but just things like that. So um, German sentiment kind of started, or anti-German sentiment started to become a little bit more prevalent once the war actually started, even though we were not directly involved. Um, people started keeping their distance, keeping their eye on these people, like, hey, well, are these guys going to go against us? You know, what's going on? But it wasn't that extreme. It was just kind of like, yeah, well. Um, so anyway, we get involved. After the, well, after the sinking of the Lusitania and then other events, 1916 and 17, we officially get involved in the First World War, which I haven't done a video on, and I'm going to have to do that. That's an interesting one. So at that point, the anti-German sentiment became rampant. Uh, most Germans up until that point, when the war was going on, we're like a lot of Americans, we're like, that's Europe's war, we don't want to get involved. It's not because we're anti-American, it's just that we don't want to get involved in a war over there. That's kind of why we came over to the United States, so we could get away from constant war and constant conflict, which the 19th century Europe was full of. And so that actually was taken as being anti-American, anti-patriotic is the big word they used. And... With that, I mean, they weren't the only group that was like that, but because we were fighting Germany, we declared war on Germany and vice versa, it was a big deal. And so people started treating the German-Americans like shit. And they started, you know, persecuting them, just kind of... Uh, laws were passed in a lot of areas where you could not speak German even at your your religious functions. You had to speak English everywhere. Uh, schools were not allowed to speak German. You had to speak English and uh, it depended on really how, what the concentration was in what area you lived in, uh, how harsh the rules were, and of course, whether the, the state or local legislation actually bought into that fear-mongering, which unfortunately a lot did, but it varied by region, so this is not like a blanket statement thing that this happened everywhere in the U.S., but it did happen quite a few places. Uh, in Minnesota, it happened. Um, we learned about that a little bit, and... That was very interesting, but yeah, it happened in Wisconsin, on the East Coast, in Texas, basically anywhere there's a large German-American population. So basically the things that happened is they started watching them and the Germans got so kind of paranoid and upset that they were actually going to be like persecuted physically, which in some cases, few and far between, it did come to that, but mostly they were just scared of being it, uh, persecuted. So... Um, 
yeah, states banned German language schools and removed German books from libraries. Some German Americans were interned. And one German American man who was also targeted for being a socialist was killed by a mob. I believe that happened um, around Chicago. I don't know. I'm not going to say that. So this is from history.com. This is an article on that. And now this one was very interesting. You guys might not have known this. So this isn't a new thing. The Japanese were not the only people we screwed over. The Japanese Americans in World War II. Um, after 9 11, a lot of Muslims had this stigma about them. And a lot of Indian Sikhs, for whatever reason, because people are idiots and don't understand that the turban is not necessarily Middle Eastern. But that's a kind of off the rails, but it's still relevant because of the anti-Muslim sentiment that happened after 9-11. So basically, every time the U.S. gets into a massive conflict and can blame one ethnic group, since we're a nation of immigrants, we've got those people to blame, and we do. Not we like me, but like just historically, it seems that there's a, there's a little bit of a pattern there. It's not repeating itself because it's a different ethnic group, different time, different reason, but it's definitely a consistency. So... It was weird because the Germans themselves, along with the other people who were very anti-German, started changing their last names. They started changing names of streets and towns. Um, this is from remaining, or I'm sorry, reimagine, reimaginingimmigration.org. So a lot of names of cities were actually changed too. Germantown, Nebraska was renamed Garland after a local soldier who died in the war. East Germantown, Indiana was changed to Pershing. Berlin, Iowa became Lincoln. Berlin, Michigan became Marna or Marne after the Second Battle of the Marne. In June of 1918, a Michigan congressman introduced a bill that would have required such name changes nationwide. And then this is where it gets really funny. Things like this, like you'll probably remember after after 9/11, if you're old enough, the anti-French sentiment um, because they didn't want to get involved in a stupid, ridiculous war. Um, this is kind of familiar, right? So this is 19, 1917. Sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. Hamburgers became Liberty Steaks. Dachshunds became Liberty Pups. And German Measles even became Liberty Measles. And that's insane. So these are just stupid things that happened. Uh, and it was very anti-German. And it, it's ridiculous because in a little bit I'm going to explain something that's very interesting. So it even says some Americans even advocated the ridding, uh, advocated ridding orchestras of music by Beethoven, Bach, and Mozart. So it's like you're taking everything German or Austrian and just trying to whitewash it and say, nope, it's not that. So a lot of German uh, people, I, I know a couple of people around here, their names were changed from Schmidt to Smith in 1917, 1918. A lot of people in Minnesota have English last names that you can directly translate to German and they have German heritage. It's very interesting how they did that. Now, they were treated like crap primarily because of the fact that you know, Germany was blamed for the entire war starting and they were Huns and, and a lot of people, a lot of German Americans were called Huns because that was the propaganda kind of name uh, term at the time. Just very, it's very sad and disturbing. And again, this is part of history. You don't have to agree with it. I certainly don't agree with treating people like that just because, but you have to understand it. At that time, it was a big deal. People were scared. Everybody was scared. The German Americans were scared. The regular Americans and non-German Americans we're scared too. So fear brings out the worst in people and obviously this is a direct result. Now a lot of you guys may not have known about this and that's totally understandable because there's not a lot of German Americans spread out as much throughout the country and if, they're, if, they, if they are and were, the numbers were so small that at that point they generally just probably kept to themselves and there's not a lot of evidence that persecution really happened widespread in areas where it was sporadically, you know, you have one or two German American families here, you know, et cetera, et cetera, versus, hey, this whole city, New Ulm, has German as its first language. Uh, everybody there can speak German. We all have the cultures. You go out, you go out and have beer after church on Sunday. That's a German tradition that got quashed after we got involved in the First World War. You see what I'm saying? Like it's it's just this fear that brings out the worst in people. And the German Americans were scared too, but they were scared in a different way that they were going to be killed just because of who they were. And a lot of these people were second generation, first and second generation. So it's like they, they could speak English, they just chose to keep up with their traditions, just like a lot of the other uh, ethnic groups and nations that, that came over here in the 19th and 20th centuries. It's just a thing. But anyway, so it was very interesting through all of this, right? And it's the same thing with the, the Japanese in the World War II, Japanese Americans and uh, Muslim Americans after 9-11, is a very large amount of German Americans volunteered and served in the U.S. military during the First World War. And they were, they, although they didn't like the fact that it was Germany that they were going up against, they still said, hey, I'm an American first. I'm an American first. I was a German and I left Germany or my family left Germany to get away from a problem. And now I want to help stop it. 
And it's weird because in those areas, like Wisconsin, I'll use it as, as an example, the 32nd Division, well, that became the 32nd Division, had a staggering amount of German-American soldiers in it. And it was interesting because when they actually got to fighting in Germany, in, or France and Germany, when they captured POWs, they were able to speak their language without an accent, just totally normal. They knew all the, the lingo and everything. And a lot of the German, a lot of intelligence was gathered just because the Germans would let their guard down and be like, oh my God, this guy, he can understand everything I'm saying. He's not interrogating me. We're just talking and having a cigarette. It's, it's really interesting. A lot of, a lot of things happen like that. And they were German Americans who were in the United States military, but their families back home were being targeted and persecuted because of their ethnic heritage. So that's a very interesting thing. Again, it's an uncomfortable topic, but with history, there's a lot of uncomfortable stuff. And it's not always unicorns and rainbows, and specifically when you're talking about a war, it's not just at the front that it sucks. This is at home. This is on United States soil during the First World War. This isn't overseas. This isn't you know anywhere else. It's here. And that really it really uh, illuminates a huge issue that people have of letting fear and fear mongering get the better of them. So I don't think it's going to change ever. Um, a lot. Of, it's not just the U.S. that does this. A lot of countries blame ethnic groups or people. And, and then, I mean, obviously Germany. Who did they blame? Um, but anyway, we you know we did the same thing in World War II with the Japanese Americans. Except we interred a hell of a lot more of them and whatever. But they there was Japanese American units. There was Japanese American soldiers that fought extremely well for the United States military. So, and then same with the Muslim Americans that. You know, became, a lot of them became interpreters and stuff and fought and were over in Iraq and Afghanistan helping the United States because they were an American first. And that's the mentality, which is very interesting. So, interesting thing that it's not a new concept at all to target a group of people, even if they look just like you. Like, this has nothing to do with skin color even. These people were all white. And it's like, okay, there's no visual difference except maybe your last name, which is why they changed a lot of their last names. Oh, Smith, that's a... English last name or something like that. It's just insane to me, but no, that, that, that's my opinion on it. That's not really a, that's just kind of what I think. But um, anyway, I'll end the video there. I just figured I'd bring this subject up because it's very interesting. I don't know why I was thinking about this the other day, but I wrote it down on my list of things to cover. Um, so let me know if you learned something or if you already knew this, if you got any experiences or stories like that <clears throat> that relate to this, go ahead and comment. Uh, if you got any questions, I'll try to answer them. It's pretty straightforward stuff though. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you consider becoming a supporter on Patreon, that'd be really great. Um, they're allowing me to get some really cool stuff that'll be helping me make some cool videos for you guys in the future. So you can thank them when I get it. I'll be definitely sucking up to them because rightfully so. I got some really cool stuff coming. I was going to get props, other things for the channel that's related to it to help teach you guys about history. It's a dollar a month. It's 12 bucks a year. That's like three cups of hipster coffee. And it's for the whole year, and it really helps out the channel because, um, again, I, I do have a full-time job, but I can't afford to be funding that much stuff out of pocket, which is why crowdfunding really helps. And I, I do allocate all the crowdfunding towards the channel. I don't just pocket it. Um, so if you get on Patreon, you'll see what I'm talking about. I actually ask you guys what you want me to spend your money on, etc., etc. All right, so we'll stop with that. Go check that out. Link is in the description. Anyway, I appreciate you watching. I'm really happy to be doing this series, and it's going to be pretty much never-ending. So let me know what you think, and we'll see you on the next episode of the First World War.